This is part two in our series on population ecology. When we left our, our story, we had been talking about how populations grow and how we can model that mathematically. We saw that uh, it, we can have an exponential growth curve if we just consider the intrinsic rate of growth, uh, looking at the birth rate minus the death rate, and not considering any other factors such as the limiting factors, such as uh, limited food or space or the accumulation of waste over time uh, that could limit how fast a population can grow. We designated carrying capacity as K and we reformulated our equation to say that the growth of a population is the R max, the rate, the intrinsic rate of growth, multiplied by the population size, but then adjusted by this factor of carrying capacity and what fraction uh, we were towards reaching carrying capacity where k minus n shows us the difference between what the potential of the population um, of the environment is to, to the population and um, where we are uh, towards reaching that and then dividing it by the whole um, we said that if the population is very small um, then this factor is near one and therefore the population grows near its max rate but however as the population nears the carrying capacity then this factor would near zero and our growth would near zero which gives us instead of an exponential growth curve uh, a logistic growth curve or this S-shaped curve so this is how populations grow uh, they'll grow slowly at first and then accelerate and at some point when N gets starting to get closer uh, high enough level to um, so that this factor starts becoming important uh, away from one and closer to zero we'll get this um, inflection point where we start to decrease the rate of, um, of the growth of the population and eventually we'll get to a growth rate of zero. Now in real populations uh, it tends to look more like this where as we reach carrying capacity we often overshoot that, hypo that, that number and we get into this stage where we're above carrying capacity and this is uh, not necessarily a happy time for a population because there may be starvation going on um, or disease running rampant through the population as the density is too much for the environment and then we get this drop off in population due to deaths um, being the death rate being higher than the birth rate when we'd actually go below carrying capacity and then we could start to grow again and you can see that would start to kind of vacillate around this number as we reached a population that was in a steady state um, had reached its capacity for that environment. So in logistic growth a population at low density starts growing slowly and then it accelerates until it levels off at the carrying capacity and there's our, our formula we used. Now we can describe population as being R selected or K selected. An R selected population remembering that R stands for the intrinsic rate of growth birth rate minus death rate um, in our selected populations, where population size is, is far from K, so that density dependent factors, the factors that are dependent on how many people are in the area, are not playing a very large role in selection. These populations are sometimes called opportunistic, and their growth rate is near the R max. We contrast that with K selected populations. These are populations whose size is near the carrying capacity so that density dependent factors play a very large role in selection. By selection we mean how well an organism can uh, cope and survive in its environment. Those individuals that are uh, well suited to handle and compete uh, in these high density situations are selected for and those that can't are selected against and in a uh, our selected population uh, individuals that are very good at um, maximizing their rate of growth uh, these opportunistic organisms are selected for. Now there's a term in here that I want to focus in on and that's density dependent factor and we need to kind of compare and contrast that to density independent factors and how they can control the growth of a population. So let's define these terms. Density dependent controls <clears throat> is when that high density and overcrowding put individuals at a greater risk of dying. For example, uh, due to predators, as the population grows, each individual, um, uh, the, the predators can come in and um, easily pick off the prey. But also parasites and pathogens 
uh, are easily transferred from individual to individual much more easily in a very dense population than a spread out population. And this actually carries a lot of uh, concern for human populations as human populations are moving from a more rural setting where they're spread out to urban centers and cities where um, a pathogen can spread easily throughout a population. Density independent factors are those factors which can decrease a population regardless of the population size. An example would be natural disasters. Thinking about these issues makes me wonder about what happens to our population as we reach the carrying capacity. Or better question, what is the carrying capacity of Earth? How many human beings can the Earth sustain indefinitely before density dependent factors start making it so we aren't growing anymore, where disease and, and famine um, and shortages of food and space um, start to impact how well we can grow. Well, let's look at these graphs. Let me start with this one. Uh, this is a graph showing the world population growth throughout history. So we can zoom in on this. And you can see that throughout history, uh, the human population has been falling a exponential growth, which really just took off um, in this area here, and we'll zoom in on this area in a minute, you can see the effect of the Black Death. Um, but for very long periods of time, human populations was growing, but growing at a slow, steady rate, and then it just took off. Now some of this taking off is just the um, mathematical reality of an exponential curve, but also think about the improvements in uh, health care and food production that kind of coincided with the already growing base population that we're building off of. But the question is, can this rate of growth be sustained? We know that uh, when we look at other populations um, in population ecology that we say that the answer is no. Eventually we have to reach some point where um, this is going to have to level off. Let's look at this graph. It's a little frightening in fact. It's scaled differently than the other one, but it's showing from 1800 to 2000 and uh, let's see where we're in here. This was made in 2006, but it was projecting forward to um, you know 2039. It looks like here. And you can see how much this rate is accelerating uh, in terms of billions of people and the number of increasing per day. It's kind of a scary idea. Now the question is, have we, or one of the interesting ideas to think about is how we as humans have maybe taken this ceiling, the carrying capacity, the point at which this should level off and maybe raise the ceiling where the uh, improvements in agriculture and the improvements in medicine and healthcare have actually taken our K, our carrying capacity, and keep moving it out further and further into the distance so that as the population increases, um, we've made the Earth um, able to sustain more people through technology and um, health care and food production. At some point we have to ask the question if we have a responsibility to start to slow this growth down intentionally through things like um, uh, family planning. Um, you know, and we know that there are certain governments in and around the world that do encourage um, the, a very specific number of children um, being raised and um, give incentives to uh, have less growth in terms of population. The question is, you know, what's the impact besides just the running out of space and food and the uh, threat of famine and uh, disease? Um, what does it mean from an economic development standpoint? Let's look at something called an age structure chart. Um, this is one of our concepts in the demographics that we need to look at. And what this kind of graph shows us is for each age level, uh, you see the ages in the middle here, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, and so forth, how many males and females, or how much of the population is made of that age group, and then also um, shows you the ver male versus female uh, percentage of that population. And the interesting thing to see is that um, a population like this one that's fast growing, the issue is not uh, so much now, but what does this mean in the future? Because as this bottom part moves up and moves into the reproductive um, time of their their lives, um, they're going to produce even more and the base of this pyramid could get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then we see an age structure like the United States um, where we have a much slower growth and then an age structure graph, uh, a chart for a country like Sweden which is showing a zero growth where at each age um, level there's approximately the same number of people, obviously less at the very top because the death rate is, is high. 
and not that many people can make it to that, that age group. Now from an economy standpoint, uh, a country like Mexico has to look at this and say, well, where is the economic development that's going to provide uh, jobs for this base population down here, this young population, as they move um, up in age and become part of the, the, um, the working population? So often, population ecology um, is tied into um, the study of economics. Let's look at one last concept before we finish up with our population ecology, and that's the idea of survivorship curves, and looking at different types of organisms and kind of the um, the pattern at which they survive. So here we have three different types of animals: a human, a squirrel, and an oyster. And if we all start with a thousand of them being produced, how many of them survive? And not only how many survive, but in what pattern do they survive? Well, for the oysters, you can see that in the first few years or percentage of their lifespan, many of them or most of them don't make it. They are food for other organisms. But at some point, if you get past a certain point, you're going to survive to a, a very large percentage of your maximum lifespan. But so the not so many of the numbers survive for a very long time, but those that make it will stay uh, a long time. Uh, contrast that to a type 1 survivorship curve, which we see in human beings, where um, early, you know, a large percentage of the um, humans survive through half their lifespan. And of course, as we get older, eventually we get to 100% of our lifespan, and therefore we can have zero people. But this type of curve is very common in, in animals that show a lot of parental care. Um, in reality, we probably should draw this with a, a little bit of a dip at the beginning and then leveling out because you know the first you know at birth um, we do lose um, it's a very vulnerable time and so we have a little drop off there but once you kind of get through that first rough patch at, at the vulnerable patch you you tend to survive until uh, age related things uh, finally get you but then you contrast that to a squirrel and what this is basically saying a type 2 survivorship curve is that hey any day of your life you're just as likely to die as any other and we'll stop there and we'll let that be our um, previews or reviews, however you're going to use them for population ecology. Certainly during class we'll talk about some of these concepts in greater detail and make sure we answer any questions you have. Um, as you've watched this um, video and hopefully the prior one, um, bring questions to class. Uh, be prepared to discuss them and answer some questions based on the concepts that you've seen.